Well, good evening and Merry Christmas to all of you. It's a gift to have you all here tonight. I want to say a special word of welcome. Again, if we have any guests or visitors from out of town, if you're home for the holidays to be with your family, if um, tonight is your first night at Christ the Redeemer, or if it's been a little while since you've been back to church, I just want to say welcome. Great to have everybody with us tonight as we celebrate the gift of Christmas. Amen? How about you turn around and shake somebody's hand? How about you say hello to your neighbor? Go ahead and just uh, tell them Merry Christmas. Tell them Merry Christmas. Tell them you're excited you didn't have to read the gospel in front of everybody. <laughs> wow. How about that one, huh? I distinctly remember when I was a baby priest. I had just been ordained. I was down in La Rose at Holy Rosary where great things happened. And I met beautiful people in my life who, who are here with us tonight. And I remember it was my very first advent as a priest. And uh, in the rhythm at daily mass, the third week of Advent is when the genealogy is proclaimed. We don't read the genealogy at any other time of the year. It's only at this Advent and Christmas season, and this is the first time that I would have read the genealogy. Mass at that time was something at, I don't know, some god-awful time, like 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, and... I distinctly remember the night before, because I distinctly remember the morning of the genealogy. That went to the hospital and, and, and came back home, and then like 30 minutes after I got into bed, had to go back to the hospital for a second call, 20 minute drive there, go to the hospital, anoint somebody, come back, and just one of those nights that's not very unfamiliar than what you as moms and dads often have to endure as your, your kids maybe uh, can't make it through the night, and an hour of sleep which many of you know what that's like. So I'm, I'm functioning on an hour of sleep, and um, I wake up for daily Mass. I have no idea what the readings are. I have no idea what I'm preaching about. So I'm sitting there during the first reading just begging the Lord, Jesus, hook a brother up with a homily. Come on out. <laughs> Give me something in the gospel that I can preach on. So the first reading is proclaimed. Responsorial psalm is proclaimed. I get to the gospel, have no idea what I'm looking at, open up the book, and I said, the Lord be with you, and everybody said, a reading from the Holy Gospel according to, oh my God, it's the genealogy. <laughs> so I am there, first time I ever read the genealogy, I'm like, Abraham was the father of, and you just kind of go through the list, and you know, easy names that, 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 are, that, are, that are great. Perez became the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. I, I can even go with Salmon. And then I got to, like, uh, I got to the, the part of the gospel. Rehoboam became the father of Abijah. Abijah the father of Asaph. Asaph became the father of, and I was like, oh, oh, Bob. <laughs> Bob became the father of Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Lord have mercy. So, uh, the Lord put on my heart tonight that, that, that somebody in here is pregnant, and you're supposed to name your kid Jehoshaphat. <laughs> so I don't know who you are, but good luck. I just, I just can see it now. Jehoshaphat, come on. Come on down over here. So I quickly went to the genealogy that year and, 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 and tried to figure out why in the world do they have all those names in there? Why is it so important? Well, it's important because of, obviously, what we read from Acts of the Apostles. In Acts of the Apostles, there's a, there's a pretty significant line. I want to just want to read it with you. Everybody go ahead and grab your missalette with me right quick. Let's go to page 34, a little blue book in your pew there. The missalette, just want to let you see one line that kind of helps you understand the significance of the genealogy. And then I want to kind of take a look at some of those names together. So, page 34 is the second reading at Mass today. It came from Acts of the Apostles. And if you read with me, they're right in the middle. It says, The God of this people Israel chose our ancestors and exalted the people during their sojourn from the land of Egypt. With uplifted arm he led them out of it. Then he removed Saul and raised up David as king. 
And of him he testified, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will carry out my every wish. Let's read the next sentence out loud together. It starts with the word from. Y'all ready? Here we go. From this man's descendants, God, according to his promise, has brought Israel a Savior, Jesus. So what, Saint, what we see in Acts of the Apostles is in Acts of the Apostles, they're referring to this promise that God made to the chosen people in, 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 in Samuel, in, in, in the book of Samuel, what we see is that God makes a promise to David that from David's line, the Messiah is going to come. So the beautiful details of the gospel tonight that shows us how Jesus is directly connected to David and, of course, to Abraham and to all of the great patriarchs that we see in, in that family line. Because, obviously, the Messiah is going to come from David's line, and, and that's the, the point of the genealogy. However, there are some interesting characters in the genealogy. Look at page 35 with me. Page 35. The very first name that's there is, is Abraham. Great man, incredible faith, was going to offer up Isaac, his own son, and, and, and his faith was a great witness. And, you're going to see people like Abraham and Jesus' genealogy. Amazing men who have amazing faith. Isaac, the next name. Isaac, he's a great man, had a great heart, led his family with a, with a heart like his own dad, Abraham. Just amazing people. Third line. Judah became the father of Perez, whose mother was Tamar. Tamar. Hmm. Um, for those of you who have a PG-13 mind, sensitive to the younger ears in here, let's just say that Tamar, she was very, uh, she had creative ways of raising money. She was a, a woman of the night. You can fill in the rest of the blanks there, okay? You might be saying, well, Father Mark, I'm not quite sure if that fits into my Christmas program. Well, hey, Merry Christmas. This is Jesus' family tree. Like of all the families that Jesus was born in, Jesus was born into a family that had saints and sinners in it. Amen? Keep going down. There's all kind of names in there. You see at the end there, Jesse, the father of David. Jesse was a great man, a man of great faith. And you see some other folks in there. You see Hezekiah. You see Jokaniah. You see Shatiel. You see Jehoshaphat. You see other people like that in there. There are people in Jesus' genealogy that did amazing things, great kings that led Israel through tough, tough times, through thick and thin. There are men and women in Jesus' family tree that were people of great faith. Joseph, a man of great faith who trusted in the Lord. There are people like that in Jesus' family tree. But to prove to you that God really is Cajun, there's actually all of South Louisiana people up in the family tree, too. There are people who gossiped about each other in Jesus' family tree. There are people who sinned up in Jesus' family tree. There are people who killed one another in Jesus' family tree. Jesus' family tree actually has people who killed his brothers so he could become king. There are saints and sinners in Jesus' family tree. There, there, are, there are murderers. There are prostitutes. There are all kinds of people up in Jesus' family tree. When you look at Jesus' family tree, Jesus' family was messy. Amen? Say that with me. Jesus' family was messy. One more time. Jesus' family was messy. So when you are at the dinner table tomorrow and you're scratching your head and you're wondering why you invited your Uncle Pookie to dinner and things like that, just know that Jesus' family was messy also. Amen? <laughs> we all have one of those uncles, don't we? Right? And if you're that uncle, just be quiet. <laughs> if you're that uncle, no. You don't need a seventh beer with the appetizers. Trust me. The first six will okay. Walk with me on over here to Bethlehem. You think that was pretty? It looks beautiful over here tonight, doesn't it? You got the trees over here. Let me tell you, the people who decorated the church did a fantastic job. Amen? We have, a, we have an amazing family here at Christ the Redeemer. It looks beautiful. Everything's all organized over here. Everything's dimensional. It's pretty. It's beautiful. 
Uh, you, you almost kind of want to lay down with Jesus, don't you, huh? Everybody go, aw. Well, it wasn't like that. Jesus, uh, more than likely, uh, good, good biblical theology tells us Jesus was born in a cave. The, uh, as close as the early centuries, uh, second, third centuries, there was a church that was built on top of a cave on the outskirts of Bethlehem. So regardless of whatever children's novel you read or what Hollywood shows you, there was uh, no innkeeper gave him some place to stay. The Bible tells us uh, very little, and they were probably born on the outskirts of Bethlehem in a cave. Now, let me tell you what was in the cave. Sheep. What the shepherd would do is he would let his sheep graze throughout the day, and at the end of the day, he would take all the sheep, and they would go into the cave. They would rest from the weather, from the rain at night, and the shepherd would lay in front of the front of the cave so that the wolves couldn't get to the sheep. Now, without offending anybody's imagination, without offending anybody's sense of uh, piety, do you know what a cave smells like when you put a bunch of sheep in it? Like, and this is really good news. I want you to hang with me here. Like, God made everything. Amen? God made sheep. God made horses. God made tigers. God made all kinds of things. When, when sheep are in this cave, it doesn't smell real, real good. They might go to the bathroom inside the cave. And that's just kind of there, night after night. And God, who has written a script for his son's birth, chooses an incredibly dysfunctional family for his son to be born into. And there's no doctor, and there's no hospital, and there's no days in, and there's no place for them. And Jesus was born in a cave where it was messy, and it was kind of stinky, and it didn't look like that. And Jesus was born in a very messy situation. So we walk around with this incredible spirit of Christmas in our hearts, and we all say, Merry Christmas. And as we sing that, as we say that, we have images of an orchestra right behind us kind of singing with us as we say, Merry Christmas. Well, Jesus' family was messy, and the cave was messy. So instead of saying, Merry Christmas, we ought to walk up to each other and say, Hey, Messy Christmas. And let me tell you why. Because most of us don't live in houses the rest of the year the way that they look at, at this time of year. Amen? If I go to your house, it probably looks a lot like this. I'll go to your living room, it probably has a Christmas tree, and it has some lights, and it has a present. And if I go to your house in February, it has your dirty socks and your tennis shoes right next to the Lazy Boy, right? And right next to the remote is the peanuts and all the other candy that you ate when you were watching TV. Amen? I'm going to go to your kitchen. The kitchen's got, that, got dishes in it. And we go to the table. On the back end of the table, has got all your bills and things like that that you were trying to pay. Hey, most of us who live in the real world don't live in a picture-perfect world. Most of us live in a messy world. And I want to say Merry Christmas to anybody who lives in the real world and has a messy life. Because most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, have families that are just like Jesus's. Amen? Maybe it's your own family. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your extended family. But a whole lot of us know that sometimes family life can be real messy. And the good news for us is that in the details of the story, God chose to be born inside of a messy family. God chose to be born in a messy situation so that we might know that this God who is with us is not afraid of messy lives or messy people or messy things. Amen? So Merry Christmas. 2013. For some of us, great year. You loved it. Best year of your life. And you are filled with gratitude and at the end of 2013. And for the other 90% of us in the church today, 2013 wasn't perfect. For some of us, 2013 was a tough year. For some of us, 2013 was, was maybe one of the more challenging years of your life. 
And, and as you're looking at 2014, some of us can't wait for 2014 to get here because we want to we want to say goodbye to the difficulties of 2013. You see, for I think a lot of us know what it's like to, to, to look at life and to have it challenging. And if your life was messy in 2013, I want to say Merry Christmas to you. Because Christmas is not a ba- about a baby. It's not about a cute scene. It's not about like jingle bells and, and candy canes. It's about the Savior of the world being a part of every aspect of our life, especially when your life is messy. So if you find yourself today just kind of needing a God in your messy world, hey, Merry Christmas. If you find yourself in need of a Savior because you know what your sin is like, I want to say Merry Christmas. If you find yourself in a marriage that is strained and you and your spouse need help or your kids are not living up to your expectations and your family needs help or your job is not the kind of job that you want and you're just unhappy at this state of life, hey, if your life is messy, Merry Christmas because that is the God that speaks to us tonight and says that he is with us. Amen. I want you to close your eyes just for a second. Just for a second. What do you want for Christmas? You know, we give presents all the time and and maybe you're given gifts tonight and you've had other people on your mind. But as we come in this church tonight, as we come in this home, God is the one who wants to give you a gift. Maybe you're praying for healing. Maybe you are praying for your marriage. Maybe you're praying for your kids. Maybe you're praying for yourself. But if Jesus Christ could give you anything, what would you want? Heavenly Father, we embrace the gift of the incarnation. We embrace your family tree. We embrace the the image and the picture and the reality of the place that you were born into. And we give you permission tonight in our messy lives to be with us. Lord, I just lift up a prayer for anybody in church tonight who's going through a tough time, anybody who finds themselves in a messy life. Bless us tonight as your sons and daughters by giving us the ultimate gift, which is the gift of your son. We ask this through his name. Amen. God bless you.